Hello, my name is Louise Hampson and I work for the Centre for the Study of Christianity and Culture at the University of York. In this presentation today, I want to talk to you about the work that we do using models, reconstructions and virtual worlds to bring collections and original academic research together to the general public. A bit of background first. The Centre for the Study of Christianity and Culture was begun in 1999 because there was a growing awareness that students lacked the background knowledge to understand the Christian references in art, literature, architecture, music, history, things like Shakespeare, Chaucer, understanding great buildings, paintings like the Wilton Diptych. None of these were accessible to people who did not understand who was being depicted and why. We're now based at the University of York and we are externally funded, so we work on a not-for-profit basis with clients and partners, including churches and cathedrals, as well as other partners. To date, we've produced five interactive resources, one of which I'll show you some of in a moment, as well as an academic book series, all to help people understand this Christian background and the history and present life of church buildings and cathedrals in particular, but also the collections and objects that they have generated. The rich history and use of these buildings and the stories of their communities through time are what have shaped our cultural heritage, and they play an increasingly important role in people's understanding of the cultural and spiritual life of our country today. It's not about people necessarily believing the religious truths or, or information, it's simply about them understanding who people are, why things look the way they do, and how that has influenced the development of art and culture in this country. Who do we work with? Well, we try and join together original material, collections and resources with leading scholarship, clients who want to showcase this material and create public understanding. All our projects draw together academics from York, but also from elsewhere, particularly worldwide experts in the field, and join those up with repositories such as the British Museum, the British Library, the Ashmolean, Lambeth Palace Library, uh, the Ashore Collection, all of which relate to or inform the work that we are doing with partners. And that project partnership is a vital part of what we do. Our principal focus is always the end user, whose interest is in the subject matter. They don't really mind or want to know who owns what, unless they want to take their research or their interest further forward. The benefits for academics to the work that we do are that they can see how their research and interpretation has transformed somebody's understanding of a topic and show a very direct connection between their work, original source material, and that transformation, which is vital for impact within the REF. The benefits to repositories are the items that are in their collections can be seen and understood in an original or relevant context, so they cease to be simply art objects or things seen in isolation, and they have put back that support material, that contextual material, that enhances people's understanding and aids and encourages inquiry. So what I want to show you now is a brief glimpse of one of the resources that we have used uh, and created. Uh, this is the front page of uh, a DVD-ROM that we have produced on the history of the English parish church through the centuries. In this animation you can see how you can line up a topic and a period and then go into a particular topic. Each topic is about 3,000 words long. Difficult individual words, one that may be not familiar, can be highlighted. We can flip to different sections so people begin to build up a connection between different sections. But if we go then to an image and click on it, we can see the collection from which it is drawn, in this case from the Lambeth Palace Library collections. We've also on this DVD made some specially recorded short videos that show people individual buildings and the objects within them. And we have created 3D models, in this case, of the interior of a typical parish church as it would have developed through the centuries, showing people that what they see today is not necessarily what was always there. 
The same for the exterior. People often find architectural plans extremely difficult to interpret and to relate to the building they say, see around them. So we have created this series of developing models whereby a typical, if there is such a thing, parish church grows and develops through time. And that two-dimensional plan grows and becomes a three-dimensional extension of a building. So that that sense that it's always looked like this is replaced with an understanding of how buildings in particular uh, grow and change and how that can be connected with and drawn from documentary evidence, archaeological evidence, the evidence of uh, building fabric and so forth. Within the work that we do, uh, we've worked with a number of cathedrals and other important buildings and I'd like to show you a couple of these now just to explain how our approach works. We've done a three-year project with Worcester Cathedral, which is the burial place of King John. And we have presented to the public uh, King John's tomb, both as a reconstruction of how it would have looked originally, and as you can see from the slide here, how different aspects of King John's relationship with Worcester have developed uh, across time, but also allowing people to explore the different uh, aspects of that interaction. So people can look at the setting of the tomb, they can look at John's relationship with Worcester, why is King John buried uh, in Worcester, they can explore his relationship with uh, the tomb of St Wolfstan and see individual real objects like King John's will. So if we explore here, uh, this is taking us to uh, the touch screen where if someone clicks on uh, the touchscreen, they can explore what the cathedral uh, would have looked like before John's tomb was built. And as you can see here, it's very different. This is drawn from um, academic research, archaeological research, paint analysis, um, scientific study. It allows people to explore real objects, to see them in a context that is no longer visible, and to understand how those different pieces of information have come together to transform their understanding uh, of the past and of that place. If we look briefly here, this is a, an artist's reconstruction of the cathedral at Worcester as it would have looked before uh, John's burial and the very lavish rebuilding of the East Nam uh, by John's son. This would trigger people's interest. How do we know? Well, the short answer is we, a lot of this is conjectural, um, but is based on some paint analysis, some archaeology, some surviving material and some comparative material. The surviving material, there are some traces of, as you can see here, the um, mortar lines painted onto lime plaster, and this green and white stonework um, survives higher up in the arches of the choir. From that, we can, to a certain extent, extrapolate, but also it is vital, um, as we will look at in shortly in another project, to be very clear with the public about what we know what we are conjecturing based on comparative material and what is frankly just work. People can then return to uh, the home screen to explore other aspects such as uh, the relationship between John's tomb and the shrines of the two saints that he was buried between um, Oswald and Wolfstone. If we look now um, back at the original touch screen you can see the different areas of exploration that allow us to showcase original material to connect the very important library um, at Worcester Cathedral that has King John's will, that has fragments um, of his clothing from when his tomb was opened in the past and documents that relate to John's interactions with Worcester. So if you for example click on um, 
John of Worcester, you can go to John the Huntsman and explore and layer this different information. So it's allowing people to explore at their own pace, to go as far as they wish to, to present information in more and more depth, uh, whilst always linking it back, as you can see here, to original material. So there's a quote from uh, Roger of Wendover, a uh, chronicler of the time. There's an image from the British Library uh, with its full reference. And then there are other um, topics that people uh, can explore that show them individual objects, both in the Worcester collections, uh, but crucially also in other collections. This slide is showing you uh, the third phase where we're looking at the cathedral in its context. This is a development phase. As you can see, it's very much a block model um, at the moment, but where we are working with other museums in Worcester, uh, as well as the cathedral itself, to build as accurate as we can an image of what Worcester would have looked like in the 13th century, some of which people can trace on the ground today, some of which is long gone. The second project I'd like to showcase to you is, again, a project very much in progress, uh, which is looking at the history and development of St Stephen's Chapel, Westminster, a building now completely lost following a fire in the 19th century, but which uh, was the original home uh, after it ceased to be a chapel of the House of Commons, so after the Reformation. Um, this very, very elaborate, very lavishly decorated royal chapel uh, gradually transformed into the first permanent home uh, of the House of Commons. Visitors will uh, enter the um, interactive by this block model, which has been created by English Heritage, that shows the whole Palace of Westminster site, which of course includes Westminster Abbey uh, and the buildings beyond. Uh, and this is the building that we are looking at here. This is St Stephen's Chapel, right down uh, on the river. A very lavish royal chapel that was um, built to, at the very least, rival, if not surpass, uh, the Saint-Chapelle in Paris. So, on this slide, we have on the left partial reconstruction of the upper chapel. This is very much, as I say, a work in progress. The blue, for example, um, is too bright. Um, we are still working on the glass, but on the right hand side you can see um, an early 18th century image of the chamber as it had been transformed by uh, Sir Christopher Wren who installed panelling galleries and so forth. So a huge transformation um, in terms of uh, the interior. We're building this up on the back of a very large Arts and Humanities Research Council project um, with the research being done by uh, a number uh, of art historians, uh, parliamentary historians and others. But here we've got part of a painted frieze which is in the British Museum, one of the very few pieces of the chapel um, to survive. And based on that, um, we've reconstructed one of the internal bays. Now the one on the left draws the colours directly from the fragment in the British Museum. But uh, obviously those pigments have degraded over time. The blue is too green, the red is too dark and so forth. So by um, pigment analysis, we have created a corrected version, um, which is the image on the right, where the blue is much brighter um, and the red, which we've discovered to be vermilion, um, again is, is brighter. So all this is drawing on both the original collection material, the original paint fragments, scientific research, scientific analysis, documentary research and the study of antiquarian drawings to then create uh, this interior. Now this very early test version of the easternmost bay is looking at some of the problems of incorporating original material directly into a three-dimensional model. Below the window glass you can see on the walls uh, three different sets of paintings. Some fragments of the original wall paintings from, do survive from the chapel uh, and are in the British Museum collections and can be viewed on their, their site. On their site, inevitably, they appear uh, very much in isolation as art objects, but here we have dropped them back into their 
uh, posited original position. But as you can see, because the fragments are degraded, uh, the colours are faded, they are 600, 700 year old fragments in, put back into a, as if it were new uh, interior. And so there's a lot of work to be done about peeling back the layers of time to bring those fragments, or at least an impression of those fragments, back to the richness and intensity they would have had. The second set of paintings are taken from the Westminster Abbey Chapter House to see whether those would serve the purpose any better, uh, but the palette is wrong. The ones in the third uh, light of the window, the much brighter colour ones, are actually taken from contemporary manuscripts, so much closer in colour intensity, uh, but nevertheless still not quite right. So. This kind of um, integrated approach of uh, research, original materials, drawing on collections um, and thinking how to present those to the public, how to transform their understanding of this lost building is a very uh, complex process but one which is richly rewarding to all the partners. One of the things that we have also done um, is allow people to see how these original fragments fitted into the original building. So this is the same freeze fragment that we were looking at earlier, but uh, digitally put back so that people have some sense of where this stone fits into the building. Otherwise, it is simply a painted lump of stone. And to simply say that it's a freeze uh, below the windows does not mean a great deal uh, to many people. Drawing on original research, we can see here one of the original medieval accounts for the building of the chapel dating from the mid 14th century and showing a purchase of Purbeck marble for the pillars and columns within the chapel. There's further purchases for the floor. This is taking an original document that to most people would be absolutely impenetrable and linking it to a feature within the model. It's showing that the model is not simply a pretty picture, but is actually a representation of an interpretation of research. Being very clear with the public about what our research is based on, what our modelling is based on, what we know, what we're guessing, what we're inferring, what we're drawing from comparable examples is absolutely vital, both in terms of academic integrity, but also in terms of really engaging the public with the process. We're inviting people in this process to draw their own conclusions, to see the evidence as we have presented it, to highlight what it has drawn, been drawn from, and to suggest to them the possibility um, that there may be other interpretations, other ways of filling those gaps changing how people understand these documents, these collections and these buildings is the transformative effect that we are looking for with impact. But the value to collections and to research bodies is that original material is brought into uh, its wider context. It's given that discussion platform and it allows people to access material in ways that they would not otherwise uh, find it very easy to do. So those are just some of the projects that we have worked on. It's an ongoing process. We're still testing out new ideas and new approaches. But we think this is one way that uh, collections, researchers and the public can be brought together in a way which is not only fruitful to all concerned, but generates new research, new information and new interest. Thank you.